Got it. Hello and welcome to Education in a Time of War. My name is Rachel Raz, and I'm delighted to have with me Nikki Silverstein. Uh, Nikki is going to share with us today initiative that she started in October after the beginning of the war on Israel from the Hamas terror organization. And um, she saw a need um, to uh, take care of ki kids in a very creative way. And we're going to learn about it. And I'm also delighted that I'm part of this project, teaching as part of that. And I see the impact and the interaction with the children. So uh, Nikki, uh, please share with us um, when the war started, what was in your mind? What were you thinking and uh, about the project that you started? Thank you, Rachel. Um, so Rachel is one of the amazing teachers in Shai Gattarie, and the way that this program started is um, in response to the awful happenings of October 7th. On October 8th, I found myself on the other side of the ocean. After 10 years of being in Israel, I came to be with my mother and my sister in New York for a longer visit. Um, and I felt like I needed to do something. And I understood that as an educator with over 20 years of experience, both in the United States and in Israel, I had the tools to be able to build an online school. <laughs> I thought, am I being like, is this a wild idea? So I called a very close friend of mine in Israel and uh, she's a very high level educator. And I asked her, what do you think about this, Madal? And she said, it's a great idea. If you manage to make this happen, please send me the information and I will disseminate it. And so on October 8th, after I got off the phone with Smadar, I uh, put out a, a call to some of my friends, but also I wrote a few posts and they went viral. They got to Singapore, they got to Australia. And before you know it, we had all these teachers from around the world who felt so desperate to do something that they wanted to be on the schedule and to teach and to reach out to Israeli families and to give them a hug from, from afar. It was what we the little we felt we can do. So the following day on October 9th, at 7.30 a.m., Smadar got the first schedule. And at 1.30 p.m., October 9th, we started teaching. Some of the teachers, even from that first day, are still teaching today. Um, and we've had over uh, 75 teachers already on our roster. Um, we've had probably about, uh, 1,250 attendances, maybe a bit more on both accounts. Uh, this means there were re returning students among that number and also some pop-in students. Um, our, uh, classes vary so many different subjects from aerodynamics to music to Torah and space as Rachel teaches and many other things that Rachel teaches to English as a second language and math games. And really the goal is, is that the volunteers from around the world choose a subject they feel most comfortable in, um, with the age group somewhere between three and 17 year olds that they feel most comfortable with. And at the time of day that can work for their schedule, no matter where they are in the world. And of course, according to Shalom Israel, the Israeli time. So we started, as we said, October 9th, and we've been evolving since. Um, when we first started, uh, children were home. Parents were freaking out. And I knew as an educator that found herself in many families' homes, and I myself, I'm a, a dedicated aunt, and I'm also very close to many families. I was, I was processing it from this place of how would it feel to be a parent right now? What do they need? How can I step in to help? And so um, I realized they would need time to themselves, but they would need to give all their energy to the children. And the only way to maybe do this is to create something stimulating something maybe that's even distracting, something that's interesting that a parent can be present. And this is how it was at the beginning. There were children sitting in their parents' laps and the parents' eyes were darting around the room and they were together in this experience. The parent was processing and the child was experiencing somebody who stepped in for that parent for a half hour, an hour, depending on how many classes they came to, we had days where we had 28 sessions. 
they were able to feel a hug, warmth, presence of somebody from abroad who could be with them. And, and for some of the people that are watching us and they are not familiar with this particular war, on October 7th, um, the Hamas terrorist group uh, shot many missiles uh, to many different parts of uh, Israel. They also hundreds of terrorists uh, across the border. Uh, they murdered uh, lots of people, over a thousand uh, people, and they burned the home and did uh, horrible, horrible things. Many families had to flee from their home. Uh, as we speak right now, about 120,000 people can't be back in their home. It's also from the south and from the north because the Hezbollah from Lebanon is also uh, starting with a war on Israel. So we have lots of people. Um, so as you mentioned, it's evolving. The first few weeks, nobody was at school because right. no one know how it's going to unfold, if it's going to be people were running to shelter and um, nobody knew how many terrorists actually went into the country. So it was a uh, very, very, de very uh, devastating and frightening couple of days. Uh, yes. And la la later on, it took a couple of weeks for some of them to go back to school. But for those people that can't go back to their home, they're um, sitting in, in hotels and in other places. Uh, so, so tell me, uh, Nikki, I know that... Um, I, I felt like many other educators when I saw um, your advertisement on Facebook, I said, okay, I'll, I'll be happy to join. And I have to say that it was very heartwarming to meet with people. One of the things that surprised me and maybe surprised you is that some of the kids weren't actually located in Israel during that time. Some families that join us with their children were in places like Greece and Portugal and, and the United States. So tell us about uh, those families. That was a little bit yeah. of a surprise for us. Right. Uh, we are dealing with a displacement uh, situation, which you mentioned, both within the country, with people that need to relocate from the south and from the north and other various locations within the state. But there were also many families that sought refuge outside of the country. And there were families, and there still are families, uh, from Crete and Greece and Portugal, and uh, also the United States and in different parts of Europe. And it's these families found themselves without a academic framework and sometimes without any uh, understanding of the culture that they went to go find refuge in. So having this program available to, available to them was also um, very helpful, um, which was, it was a surprising, shocking, tragic, and people are really making the most of these experiences, you know, um, trying to, again, invest the time with their children in the right way, seeing the learning opportunities that exist out there. Um, yeah. Nikki, tell us about the name of the initiative, the project that you started. It has a very special name. Thank you. So Chagat means lion's roar. And uh, there are two main reasons why I felt it needed to be this name. The first one is because my father, who passed away 19 years ago this week, um, uh, in, he's a, he was Israeli and he was uh, one, of, he, one of the lights in my life. He is the light in my life that continues to guide me. And uh, he served in the IDF. Um, and much of his uh, passion and investment in time and in philanthropy was with, with regard to Israel-related issues. Um, even in the last parts of when he was dealing with his stuff, his illness, um, he uh, spoke about soldiers. Why must they be dying all the time? And I felt like he was going through his PTSD at the end think this stuff lasts with us forever, which brings up a whole psychological and emotional element of, of our work and the importance of this school too. Even though we're not coming from a uh, psychological perspective, being present with somebody is part of the healing. And um, But the second reason, uh, so my father's roaring from heaven as I, as I feel and um, very, um, trying to move us in the right direction. 
And the second thing was, is uh, when you speak to a little child and you ask them, can you roar like a lion? And they do the, there's a second there where they really feel like they're a lion and they feel strong and they feel like they can be a protector. And that's what I want them to feel like. I want them to feel strong and have it, that they can protect themselves. And they also want to protect their family, these little ones. And may they feel strong. And I know that you created a slide that we can see this lion. Uh, okay, I'll show you. Well done. This, this lion roaring, um, it, yes. it's again, sending them this message. And this was like the first uh, kind of email or flyer that you created. Can you translate for us? Yes. Okay, so first I just want to say that this picture was donated to us actually by Tamir Itzhaki, who's one of the teachers in our program. He teaches aerodynamics. And uh, he took this picture in Africa while he was on safari. And uh, he said, please use it, which is so nice of him. So thank you. Um, this message went out from the very beginning. Dear families, we started this school, uh, a virtual school, um, which is actually an enrichment program too. Uh, it's taught by volunteers for children in Israel and families that found refuge outside of Israel during these difficult times. The school is taught by teachers who are volunteers from different Israeli and Jewish communities around the world. So we put everything on a spreadsheet. The entire schedule is on a spreadsheet. Um, it didn't require registration because we didn't want people to feel that they needed to share their names or their locations or even plan ahead. It was all open links. So that meant that we didn't even know who was going to be joining. And this meant the teachers need to, needed to be prepared for whoever was going to come in and whatever different level they were going to come in. Uh, and although we recommended different age groups, um, we have uh, children with, with um, varied uh, backgrounds that are joining us, uh, different ages, um, we different amounts of kids that are coming. And every one of these teachers, every one of these incredible people that I, I just am amazed by, uh, go in with this um, approach. The, t the, the students, the families will sort of guide me on what we're going to learn. I've chosen a subject matter. We know what the lesson is about, but depending on the needs, desires, interests, we all will, will follow what's in the room. It's incredible. And it's it's truly differentiated learning is one of the biggest challenges in education. It is, it is spectacular how every one of these volunteers has risen to that challenge. It's def definitely a very exciting to see this like very diverse group. And I can I can share as somebody that taught several sessions. I I, I offered many different type of sessions. Like one of the sometime I had five-year-old with a 15-year-old and with the parents in the background. And, and it was just like a nice place, like a living room where we all came together. It was a very nice and safe space. Um, and I deliberately chose topics that uh, allow them kind of to open and talk about uh, where they are physically, emotionally, um, so we can, we can be together. Like one of the sessions that I actually enjoyed doing very much was uh, how to write a book. I'm, I'm an author of three different books and, uh, and I brought it and we spoke about books, but, but one of the books that I shared with them is actually a biography that I wrote about my father, which was also a child. Uh, here, on, uh, here, the picture on the right, he was a refugee when he was 12, when um, the war of independence in Israel took place and his house was burned and he had to leave his house. And he actually lived with 40 other families in a synagogue for six months. So we had this full conversation about that. What do you do in a time that you can't have the, your comfort of your home, the security of your home, your community, and you can still succeed. My father today uh, is 87 and uh, had a very productive life. And I think in some sense, we are thinking about the same thing. 
how can we, despite these uh, wars, this, the, despite the fact that some of the kids can't be in their home or with their community, how can we give them this, the tools and the skills and, and uh, the comfort uh, to build a healthy life, you know, moving forward? So mm -hmm. um, is there anything like, did you hear back from parents, some update about it, like something or from the teachers about their own experience? Yes, um, I have some quotes. Can I share them with you? Abs absolutely. I want to, hold on. Ooh, we'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so Talia Berkovich is uh, one of the teachers who started pretty much straight at the beginning, and she taught um, native English speakers reading second grade and up, taught them for two and a half months, and now we'll talk about collaboration soon, but she is now teaching sixth grade class in a public school in Israel that needed um, a teacher and couldn't find one there. That'll be something else we talk about. She said... I offered an English reading class. As the week went on, this class became young readers, who, young speakers who told their friends. Today I had six students and each parent thanked me practically with tears in their eyes for doing this. Such gratefulness. I'm sure many of us are feeling like we need to do something. I wasn't sure what skill, superpower of mine could be beneficial or contribute in any meaningful way given the circumstances. Hearing the thank yous helped me understand how important this is as part of the war effort. I think what she says really uh, speaks about teaching the way that it really truly is. Education is a superpower. It's a it's a superpower. And she um, really explained that so well. And it is a very important part of the war effort. Um, I want to share what, what one of the parents said about Shagat uh, Ariel. She said, the lesson was the most beautiful hour of Turi's day. Turi's father was in the army. He was drafted into the army. And I had an hour of quiet to organize the house. And Turi enjoyed a story and enjoyed speaking to the teacher. Thank you very much. You are holding us from afar. Some time to forget about our problems and our worries and our missing Leaba, missing daddy. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and, and, to, and today, you know, we are uh, actually recording this uh, um, on December. We are on December 26th. It's um, Almost, you know, two, two and a half months since the war started, and and I know that we we mentioned a little bit when it started, uh, when there was no school. Now most of the school went back to schooling. It's either in in person in the school or for the families that had to move to hotels in different communities. They either open specific schools for them uh, in in a different um, recording. We have about preschools, somebody that shared how they opened preschool in over 40 uh, hotels for these children. I know in a different, in another um, a vlog, we're going to um, hear from somebody that opened a school for older kids. So, so kids are basically in person learning right now. So tell us a little bit about the evolution. I know that the Shagat area is still continuing with many of the families that are out of the country. But there is like a second phase or a third or fourth. I don't know where you are now. Right. Yeah. Yes, um, certainly. So as we said, the first week, the kids weren't even at school, nor did they have distance learning. By the second or third week, schools were going back to a little bit of Zoom, but not even a full day of Zoom. Then it continued and became more distance. And then they tried to bring everybody back to the buildings, including the displaced children who they were trying to build these makeshift schools and they succeeded in hotels and as we as we said, but it took some time to get that up. Schools, physical schools were, were dealing with some challenges of, is there enough space in our uh, bomb shelter to bring everybody in? And according to that limitation of how many people could fit inside, were they allowed to bring in the students? Do we have enough people to patrol the schools? 
And if we don't have enough people to do security, then we can't bring people in. They, there were all these challenges to bringing kids back to the physical school. Once they figured out a way to make this happen, some places needed to rent new space and so on. As you said, at this point, thankfully, and it's such a big thing to be thankful for because routine is a very big part of normalizing life. It is so important to building confidence in all people, children especially. So now we are mainly running after school sessions so that although some kids went back to their hugim, their extracurricular activities, some haven't. Of course, people's budgets also changed. So you can't expect with so much um, going on that life is exactly the same. So we are there to provide also to the kids that are with, in a different type of framework abroad, they can connect to their Israeli family, to other students. Oh, wow, I have a great student from a, from one of our teachers, Nomi. She also started pretty early. She teaches English as a second language to fifth through ninth graders. And she told me she had the community that formed in her class. And these kids became friends with each other. They're from different parts of Israel. And one of them is actually abroad, okay? So there's one person abroad and three of them from three different parts of Israel. And this little community, they decided that they're going to play Fortnite after her class. So not only are they meeting within her class, they're meeting after her class too, which is part of the reason why this is also special because people wouldn't have that chance to meet otherwise. It's incredible. It's truly connecting, like it has in some way, in its small way, removed the oceans from us. And the entire Jewish Israeli community of the world is hugging each other in a big, big circle, really, really tight. Um, and thank God for technology. Technology is what's enabling this. I can, even add to, I can even add to it, uh, Nikki, that uh, when I was looking at the spreadsheet of different session I said I want to join this like walking tour in Singapore with this teacher I want to join this session with the flute and, and learn about you know and learn about theory of music I want to join this um, a drawing class I want to join this yoga so it was also very nice to see this vast you know group of very talented people really great people and and um now i'm, I'm i feel comfortable also reaching out to them for different projects so you also yes. created this community of teachers that uh somebody from argentina and several people from the from the us and and um and it's just like really exciting to get to know other communities uh, around the world yes I really appreciated the fact that you said, and you, in addition to a few other teachers, wanted to meet each other. And so we had that uh, um, online networking uh, sort of opportunity, which also then a week later, we had the Hanukkah party, um, which was community-wide and families from Israel and those finding refuge and teachers from all over the world all joined in together for a Hanukkah candle lighting and Minnie Stillman did music and Shai did music, Shai Spet, Rabbi Shai Spet. And Rachel did some of her film for us from Space Torah, from the Dreidel in Space. And Miriam did an art project, Miriam Buchmann from Seattle. So that was, um, it was all the families. It was very special. So I, I know, Nikki, that uh, now there's also collaboration with schools because I know that um, several schools reach out to us and principals to come and say that the teachers are exhausted. Many teachers are actually being drafted to the, to the IDF that they are serving. Um, and some teachers don't feel comfortable driving to certain areas because of the missiles. So there are, there are the shortage uh, of uh, in-person educators and, and they ask how we can help. I know that you mentioned one of the teachers that start teaching English you know, she's uh, remote and she's teaching a school in Israel. And I know that we're talking about a few more. Can you share with us more about that? Sure. Well, thank you. So there are a few different stages to this, too. Um, at the Probably about the second week of the war, um, I, I worked in partnership with another two organizations. They reached out and they said, a meet, the chain of schools, is looking for uh, substitute teachers. So we started doing the search because so many people contacted and we and we opened 
a way for people to also teach in the regular high schools in, in their chain. Another thing that happened was something that Rachel, you introduced me to, uh, to Muli. And so that now we are working with these uh, schools in the Ministry of Education. Um, I'm also working with Naga. You made the amazing introduction for, and we're doing twinning with many different schools abroad to bring Israeli schools and Amer and not only American schools abroad. We also have Canadian. We have uh, we're growing it to do the twinning. Um, Na Wolf, who's an incredible, also an early childhood educator, who's on our program, introduced us to um, SAR Academy and to Bogre Rechov Sumsum. We started a program where we bring pre Israeli preschoolers together with American teenagers from SAR Academy, and they work with Rechov um, Sumsum uh, Sesame Street uh, curriculum in order to to develop communication. Um, and uh, Today, for example, Tamir, uh, the aerodynamics teacher, went to Ashdod, to an Amit school in Ashdod, and he taught aerodynamics to three ninth grade classes because he happens to be on a visit in Israel right now. And um, so I think that these, uh, what you're saying about how we, in fact, we, we no longer need to just look at local, <laughs> like with everything else. Um, we have a pool of, talent, a pool of caring, loving people who want to all be in the same space. And I want to throw in that while at the beginning, it really felt like we as a community abroad would be the supportive ones to the community in Israel. I think that we've also learned that in time, as the weeks pass and anti-Semitism in the world grew and continues to grow, that we need each other. It's not only that by being in these encounters, we, the people abroad, are supporting the Israelis, or the, we're Israeli, you and me, but we're, but I mean, the families in Israel or the families that found refuge from this. No, it's, it's both ways. We are supporting each other by knowing that we're there for each other and the togetherness is holy. Yeah. No, thank you. This is... Um... You know, it's inspiring to see the growth of that and, and to see, you know, we always say it takes a village, you know, to raise a child and, and the, the village just grew. The situation actually um, made it that, you know, the, the village just uh, become wider. Thanks to technology, we're very thankful that we can do that. But thanks, you, thanks to initiative, somebody like you that took it on yourself to come and said, let's do it. And I think you know when I when I start doing this uh, conversation about education in time of war, yes, I'm looking in particular right now at the war in the Middle East and in Israel in the center of that, um, and the children and what's going on there. But I want us to also send this message, you know, as we learn from everything that we're doing, there are some a situation in other parts of the world. You know, there can be a hurricane and other natural disaster, and not just war. There's also can be a situation when a community don't have local teacher or talent. So how can we use other people? And I'm going to interview uh, more people. Uh, I'm going to have conversation with many people at the Museum of Science and in different communities around the globe. And and uh, and there's just like so many opportunities. And the nice thing that it's not necessarily came up from a government or came up from organization. It's the individual mm -hmm. that's so in need. And we're creative enough to start. It mm -hmm. was like a startup. You didn't know how many people you're going to impact. You didn't know if this war is going to be for two weeks. We don't know where is the end of it. You know, we are. It's still unfolding, unfortunately. And we don't know when one day will uh, lead us. You know, uh, the next day. So, yeah. is there anything, uh, Nikki, that you you want to share, or you wish I asked you? Um, that you want to share with our audiences about Shagat Ariyeh or some of these um, big messages to everyone? Um, I think um, the desire to help is a real, um, it's a real energizing force that uh, sometimes we feel 
we don't know what to do with ourselves. And that is like a blessing. So sometimes we shut it off because we have to go on with our regular life. But I don't think that this war is allowing any of us to shut it off. And what I'm saying is, is that we have no choice. Every single one of us right now, we're feeling like we need to help. That's because we do. And um, I, I really appreciate how many people are stepping up to it. And I appreciate all these different efforts that are happening. And I appreciate what's going on in Israel right now. All this volunteerism that's happening, all the mobilization of society where every single person from baking challah to baking pizza, to helping deliver things, to collect, to fundraising for uh, military uh, needs, to have helmets, to have uh, vests, all of this stuff. I mean, we are part of it. We are all part of this effort, no matter where we are in the world. And it, I feel like that's really powerful. I don't know if we ever felt it that way in the past, you know? And it's part of the mindset, you know, not to be, yes, it, it's of awful, uh, terrifying situation, but it's not to be a victim, but rather to stand up to do our best uh, to live the, the fullest uh, in some ways. So even under these like very extreme uh, circumstances, how can we uh, do more? And in some way, you know, the reason I started to do this, uh, to hold this conversation, because these stories are actually not going out of the country. People don't really know about them because they're, people are just doing. People are just busy mm -hmm. doing and usually Things are highlighted when when there is a disaster and you need support from outside. Like you have, as I mentioned, like 120,000 people that can't go back to their home, but you don't see like the WHO coming in and needed to take care of them because it's the local people that's stepping up, people from abroad um, that are doing, and the people themselves. Everybody is working together to make mm -hmm. it as 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 bearable as possible with, with the less uh, trauma and um, and actually to grow from that. And I think this is another thing that another message that I want to, to share that even with the extreme situation, it's not to wait necessarily for the solution to come from outside, but how we are going to work with the solution. And of course, yes. for the people that were killed or the people that are kidnapped, this is a total different situation. Those that their house is burned, they lost loved one, it's totally, it, it's a different uh, situation, but at least the majority that just can't be in their houses or it's not safe, you know, to, to make sure that they get uh, some kind of a quiet and, and learning and growth. So, um, yes. yeah, so, so I, I want to thank you, Nikki, and at least you thank have you. anything, any other message you want to say or any question for me. Um, uh, but I have many questions for you, maybe not all for this interview. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you so much. We will continue the conversation. And I want to thank you, uh, Nikki Silberstein, uh, the founder of the Shagat Ariel Lion Roar. It's an online camp and school for children uh, that are affected by the war in Israel. And I am Rachel Raz. I am uh, the one hosting a conversation about education in the time of war. Thank you for watching and join us for the next one. Take care yes. and for peaceful time. Amen.